have you observed in musicians that there are these points at which they tend to get stuck? It's, it's part of the creative nature of, of people, of humans. And you have to kind of learn to out-trick those reasons. I think it's a switching between left and right brain. So for me, there's like a right brain part when you start jamming and you come up with a new idea. It's that first love and everything goes easily. And then the, you will encounter a dip, especially in production, because it takes, you know, it takes so many hours to finish the song. You will get to the point where you're saying, this is not, is this any good? Is this, you know, I hate this or is it worth it? And so people leave the project and start something new and they never finish things, which is just very common. I don't think it's just a musical thing. But if you then can put on your right brain and saying, well, let me put my producer cap on and let's, let me follow certain guidelines and just plow through this and say, like, it doesn't have to be perfect. Let me just do 80-20 rule, like good enough to move on and good enough to move on. And then later on, I can fix it if it's really worth fixing. But yeah, we get stuck in the middle when we lose trust and we heard it too many times. And then in the end, for me, often it comes around again where I say, yeah, no, no, I think it's good. And I think I can, I can finish this. But it's, it's a long journey. This is the Unstarving Musician podcast. I'm your host, Robonzo. The podcast features conversations with me, indie music artists, and industry professionals. And it's all intended to help other indie music artists be better at marketing, business, the creative process, and all the other things that empower us to do more of what we love. Make music. Welcome to another episode. I'm so happy and honored to be in your ears or speakers or both <laughs> today. It's a warm day and a windy day in Panama today. I hope your weather's great. I am counting down the days to our move to Querétaro, Mexico. That's coming at the end of this month, March. Coming fast. So I got that going on. The secret to writing and recording songs to completion is something that Mark Dold wants to share with you and me. <laughs> He's a songwriter, platinum-selling producer, Apple-certified logic instructor, and indie artist known as Mock Phoenix on the music platforms. This is Mark's third appearance on the podcast. You can also hear him in episodes 131 and 165 of this podcast. I will put links in the show notes, of course. He was living in Malta when we spoke last, but he's relocated to nearby Gozo. And if you're like me and didn't know where either of those were, but maybe heard of one of them, those are islands in the central Mediterranean between Sicily and the North African coast. Before I get to my conversation with Mark, I want to mention a podcast that I have recommended here for you before. It's called the New Music Industry Podcast, and it's hosted by David Andrew Weeb. David dares to go where few music marketing and business podcasts go. He features interviews with amazing guests, ranging from producers and composers to artists and executives, even some internet marketers. David also drills down into other industries, returning to listeners his insights from various marketers and experts demonstrating every possible way artists can find their path. You can find out more about the show at musicentrepreneurhq.com and hear it on all of your favorite podcasts and audio platforms. Again, the podcast is called The New Music Industry Podcast, hosted by David Andrew Weeb. You should check it out. When Mark and I reconnected as he was finishing up a course called Musical Architects, which he describes as a practical workshop that teaches how to write, arrange, record, produce, mix, and importantly, finalize a song. He has produced and remixed for more than 50 major artists such as Nelly Furtado, Luis Fonsi, Paul Van Dyke, Peter Gabriel, and Vogue, Alice Cooper, Cindy Lauper, Luther, Luther Vandross, Vandross, did I say that right? God, it's been a long time since I said that guy's name. Erasure and many more, leading to several top five billboard hits including two number ones. Needless to say, he's qualified to teach you and me how to get it done, so to speak. We talk a little about his upcoming album. He asks me about my experience recording my first two singles. We talk about his music architects course, getting stuck in the recording process, how he starts his day with deep work in mind, and house concerts, a favorite topic of mine. On the topic of deep work, Mark mentions in our conversation a book he was then reading called Deep Work by Cal Newport. Since our conversation, 
for this episode, I heard the author on uh, Cal Newport on the Tim Ferriss Show, one of my favorite podcasts, and have since added deep work to my reading list. Cal Newport also has his own podcast, which I'm enjoying thoroughly. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes for all of this in case you are interested. And now, here is me and Mark Dold, a.k.a. Mock Phoenix. Mark, thank you for coming back to the podcast. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Yes, absolutely. I was excited to see you were interested in coming back. We were talking about this pre-roll here, but you have actually been on twice. So the first time was November 15, sorry, when we first spoke, not when the interview aired, but we first spoke on November 15 of 2019. And Mm -hmm. then again on the 17th of June for kind of a special project episode I was doing uh, of 2020. So I had this vague memory. We talked about the pandemic, but I'm like, no, that can't be right. But what's (laughs) been, what's been happening since then musically and otherwise? Um, that was the year I released my first record as an artist, as a solo artist. Now I have many done many records uh, with with a band and for other people, but this was my Mark Phoenix project, officially launched into the world. And uh, so that was that year was kind of you know the year after was I think when I focused on that project. And then last year or at the beginning, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I thought let me take advantage of this time where we all locked in and <laughs> can move around as freely as we used to and write this course I wanted to write for the longest time. And so last year I wrote a lot of songs for my new project, but I couldn't focus on production of music on top of the video editing and production and all the time it required to do the course, which we probably will talk about. And so I last year was pretty much taken by completing this course, this video online training course. Very nice. Yes, we are going to talk about that. And before I ask you about it, I don't remember from the last time we talked if you were still in Malta, but where are you living now? In Malta? I am in Gozo, the little sister island of Malta. That's correct. How do you Definitely say it? Knows. Gozo. It's G O Z O. And don't tell anybody because it's it's so nice because there you know not a lot of people know about it. I'm coming to visit you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been a very honestly, it's very very chill place to go through this pandemic because yeah. It, it, you know, not a lot of people live here and it's, it's been pretty easy. Um, of course there are cases and things like that, but, but comparing to cities and where people, you know, we're locked into small apartments, yeah. nothing like that. So yeah. Were you, how, how was, you, how was it for you in Panama? You're still in Panama at this point, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're working on a move to Querétaro, Mexico, but, um, you mentioned that, that this, probably uh, won't happen before March and hopefully by then, but yeah, we're still in Panama. You know, it was good. We lived by the beach, and I, which I believe, mm-hmm. if I remember right, you did as well in Malta. Yes, you were yes, kind yes, of yes. by beach. Yeah, so I can see yeah. the sea from my from my studio. Yes, nice. Um, so yeah, it was easy for us. We had mobility in a country that was pretty strict in terms of uh, trying to responsibly kind of lock things down at certain times in the beginning. But it was a little weird. Yeah, we had things like alternating shopping days by gender or by ID number. And then we had some no alcohol periods. You know, it was for not, not that I didn't want to drink, but they, you, know, you couldn't buy it. Um, uh, of, mm-hmm. course, of course, those of us that were a little more nimble in the social circles were able to procure it anyway. But, <laughs> but, um, hmm. but yeah, it was okay. Uh, the, the country has, has done um, pretty well in terms of mitigating uh, you know, the, all the losses I, economically, though, I don't, don't really know. I think that's yet to be seen, but probably the case for everyone, right? Yes. Yes, yes. Well, and then one more question before we talk about your course. Mm-hmm. You are thinking about another album coming up? Yeah, I'm actually today. I've been preparing files to send to um, some musicians, the percussionist in Spain to play on it. Um, and I got, yeah, you know, lots of songs, but I have to just sort of make time for the production the f- because that's always where the time goes in the end. Um, and hopefully I want to just, you know, release uh, song by song and then build up to an album during this year. Amazing. So that means you'll do some singles and then compile something that maybe has some new things on it to make an album. That is correct. Cool. That's, I wouldn't say common, but I, I have talked to a few people uh, looking to do things that way. And I've kind of imagined if I, become prolific enough after writing only two songs since I started. Uh, that, Was that, that the only I, two songs? I thought you'd been doing this all all along, all your life, no? No, in fact, that first one, I guess I started working on that in 20, let's see, 2019, and then it got released in 
2020, if I remember correctly. And um, no, that's not right. It got released at the beginning of 2021. So I was working on it in, in 2020. Um, and up to that point, I've just been sort of a gigging, subbing, working, and part-time, for the most part, a musician, um, mm -hmm. playing various types of venues, events, and um, occasionally recording. My recording experience up until recently has been very, very thin, but it still is in terms of being like a, a bona fide session player, but hopefully that will change in the, in the new year. So, so how was that experience? Uh, since you're the perfect candidate for my course, um, <laughs> what is the, what was that experience of producing your own music? If I may well, ask? I, I don't consider myself having produced it other than like, when I think of producers, I think of like this one person who made it happen regardless of their skill sets. Um, but I had a, a sound engineer and, and guy who masters who also played guitars for me mm -hmm. on both songs his name is Chris Responti, and he has a, a rich history and um, working in Nashville and has had some, a few high profile projects and just a lot of things in between. And I, I like his playing a lot and his production was good for me because we, he approached, he didn't really know I had every intention of paying him, but he liked my first song enough to just do it with me as a fun project, even though we didn't know each other super well. So we did, and, and it came out nice. And then we did the, the second one uh, was a, was a, um, a collaboration with a guy I met online through a website called Compose uh, mm. with a K and a Z. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. It's for, for people who are kind of looking to collaborate with others. And he had this wonderful, for me, a wonderful um, keyboard composition that, that we put song to. And I used the same guy for mixing. But the, the real, really to kind of relate to your question, though, the real learning curve was just getting set up where I could record an acoustic drum set at home and, and sort of engineer that part properly so that my guy in mm -hmm. Dallas uh, or in Dallas, Fort Worth could, could do his thing. And, and also working, you know, with the other musicians for the first, there was um, three of us on the first song and four of us on the second one, and just kind of working with people for the first time, which was kind of the easy part. Um, but I, over the many months that have passed, I, have had just a tiny little taste of doing some recording with with and for others and you know talking to as many people like you as and in between you and me in terms of our ability to record or produce has really piqued my my interest so i guess now i feel very competent in terms of recording drums and vocals uh but uh, mm -hmm. i'd love to, i'd love to be able to do more you know what i mean yeah, I mean it's an endless, endless journey and and, and learning curve. So, but uh, it's not going to get boring. So it sounds like you enjoyed the process, though. Yeah, I did. Uh, it had its moments, um, but I imagine it's kind of that way for most indies, all indies. But you know, things don't always go as expected. And then, I don't. Know, maybe the. It's funny. I guess the pandemic did have have some ramifications because my friend, the the. Um, engineering whiz kid chris he he uh he got a, a ton of work as a result i think of the pandemic mm -hmm. um, people wanting to work on their projects or, or do projects for the fir first time um, not too unlike me i guess and so uh, that that caused some not huge but a little bit of time lag and then you know you you make your own time lags i guess if you're a drummer or any musician and it all mm -hmm. compiles that was a big learning lesson M managing the the time spent <laughs> when you're working with multiple people yeah and if it's your own project you don't even you might not know what you're looking for and you have to test and trial and error will guide you but but it's hard the hardest i think for doing your own projects because you're too close to it a and secondly you might not know where what your style and direction is to begin with so if you get a job it's it's a little bit more defined i think yeah 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 i can see that okay so let's talk about uh, is it is it called musical architects that is it yes the course um mm -hmm. I, now i guess to set this up for anyone who's hearing us speak for the first time that you, you have been on the podcast a couple of times and i'm going to make sure if you're listening to this one and want to hear those other episodes you'll be able to do that by coming to the show notes for this one but uh you, just to kind of set the stage at a super high level you spent a couple of decades as a producer in los angeles and we talked about in our first conversation, a lot of kind of high profile people that you did remixes for and some other work. And you also studied jazz and songwriting at Berkeley College of Music. And that's kind of just the surface, but tell, tell me about the course, uh, anything, you know, that, that 
do you want to tell about it? I mean, it's sort of where everything came together for me as as my life so far, musically speaking, um, because my parents were classical musicians, just in a nutshell. And there was music since I was a small child, which was probably great education, but it really clicked when I could start making my own music. So around you know, in my teens, I got an electric guitar and and I got a four track recorder. And since I didn't have all the people I needed to make a band yet um, in good old Switzerland, it's not the most you know rock and roll friendly country, maybe. <laughs> I started recording myself and it sounded probably like hell, but I learned, I just tried to imitate what I heard. And with that technology available back then, this was really hard, but it never, I never lost that passion for, you know, making demos, then making recordings, then start helping other people. And so it, I guess I, I became a producer without knowing it by arranging my own track and then doing it for others. So that's sort of where I come from, besides then doing the form of classical guitar and then electric and then so a long story short, I moved to Los Angeles at some point and I started helping other people with setting up their gear and recording them and then producing them, remixing them. So I just gradually grown into it. Um, and that's sort of more than I, I stopped playing guitar here and there and, and always pick it up again, but producing was always there. Arranging was always there. Sort of, I'm, I'm a, so almost like a producer of song maker first before I'm a musician even. So that's sort of, I, it led me to this class. Let me combine all these experiences into something that teaches other people. Practically, creatively, technically, all together, how to write and produce a song from beginning to end. So that was sort of how this came together. When, when I first read your mention of the, that you had this going on, this course, I thought, and, and you told me exactly, almost exactly what you just said at the end there, um, you know, writing, I don't know if you used all these words, but you, there was more than mm -hmm. just what I thought initially, what I what I actually read and what I thought I read, but you have here, it's like a, it's a practical workshop that teaches how to write, arrange, record, produce, mix, and finalize a song. Mm -hmm. uh, what I had, you know, thought I'd read is like, oh, you know, it's the, the technical aspects of uh, production, but it's more than that. And it makes sense because of the wide, you know, background and the years that you've been doing all this. Is there a part of it that you are more passionate about than others. I um, mean, I assume it's all uh, a passion project and hopefully a very successful one monetarily, but is there one part that you just really love the most? In, in about the course or yeah. in music making in general? Or... The course. The course. Um, if I understand your uh, question correctly, like of course, for me, the, the passion part is that Maybe let me, let me add to it that I, I was teaching at this place called Musicians Institute in Los Angeles for about close to 10 years. And I was teaching logic. I was a certified logic instructor. But like academia, academia often does, it takes things and separates them. Like, so you learn the technology, the, learning a DAW, learning theory or, you know, harmony or something like that. And for me, like in the end, we write a song, it's holistic. We need to bring it all together. And so... This is more what I try to achieve is like have something that it takes into consideration all the aspects of writing and producing a song. And of course, you could always go deeper, but what's the minimum you have to know and do to get a good result, something releasable that might not be the last best song, but it's something that you can proudly demonstrate and is finished. And that that takes a very creative approach and it takes a very techno, uh, technical approach and all together. And I think that's what my passion is about. Like, can we make it, can we bring it together? Like we do it in everyday songwriting and production. I like that. I imagine that many independent musicians will get stuck at some point, no matter how involved they are and from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. in, in, because if it's your song, unless you have someone who's invested in you, in your success with you, if it's, if it's just you, like me, for instance, I was the only one interested for the, I was the primary interested person in finishing the project mm -hmm. and i can see yes. for many many people it's easy to get stuck somewhere do you have uh have you observed this in in musicians that there are these points at which they tend to to drag or get stuck that is is more common than other parts of the process it's it's part of the creative nature of of people of humans and there's many good reasons for that i think and you have to kind of learn to out trick those reasons. I think it's a switching between left and right brain. So 
for me, there's like a right brain part when you start jamming and you come up with a new idea. It's that first love and everything goes easily. And then the, you will encounter a dip, especially in production, because it takes, you know, it, it takes so many hours to finish the song. You will get to the point where you're saying, this is not, is this any good? Is this, you know, I hate this or is it worth it? And so people leave the project and start something new and they never finish things, which is just very common. I don't think it's just a musical thing. But if you then can put on your right brain and saying, well, let me put my producer cap on and let's, let me follow certain guidelines. And I have a roadmap and that's also what this course is about. So you can follow step by step and just plow through this and say, like, it doesn't have to be perfect. Let me just do 80, 20 rule, like good enough to move on and good enough to move on. And then later on, I can fix it. If it's really worth fixing, I will record the part again or quantize it, whatever it needs. So, but yeah, we get stuck in the middle when we lose trust and we heard it too many times. And then in the end, for me, often it comes around again where I say, yeah, no, no, I think it's good. And I think I can, I can finish this, but it's, it's a long journey. I have talked to some musicians uh, who record and, and produce their own stuff that have not a lot of them, but have a fairly large library, like a back log uh, or back catalog of things that they've not released. Mm -hmm. Which I honestly don't know, even though the impression they gave me was one thing. I don't know if that's because they are not great at finishing projects or they're just so prolific in their songwriting that they want to start these things and let them be for a while and let them sit uh, until they just feel, you know, they want to, they can take a break from their ideas. Do you, do you, mm -hmm. Have you seen this before or ever experienced it? Or do you have any uh, cautionary notes for that type of personality? Well, I, I can relate to that. I'm in the same situation now, simply because I write much faster than I produce. I mean, if I can, I can write out 80% of a song in four hours, that's decent. But then every remainder half of that takes the same amount of time. So the last percent takes as much time um, than the first, you know, 80%. So and then production exponentially that time. So I, I could understand that people write songs and didn't have the time to produce it yet or you know especially if you do it by yourself because yeah it takes time yeah. and yeah maybe other reasons i don't know yeah the funny thing you're we were talking about all these different pieces and i was thinking for the first time i was thinking you know the playing part of it is probably not my favorite part and that's the, re the playing while you're recording or yeah yeah really you know, okay. yeah which is in this is um doing the drums which is my most comp mm -hmm. I'm most competent doing that. And then the singing for different reasons, but uh, the singing maybe was more exciting, but for some reason, but mm -hmm. it's probably just because of a confidence of not having recorded enough in my life to, to not be kind of freaking out about it in my own head. But I had so many friends, you know, that I would send the early demos to and ask them to just, you know, let me know if they hear anything glaringly, um, in need of, of fixing. And then, you know, on my second one, because of my recording, my play space situation, recording space situation, I actually had to finish before I was finished, but it was um, enough for my cohort to work with that he was able to make a couple of adjustments for me on the drums. But isn't that funny, mm -hmm. though, that's not the playing part that I enjoyed the most. <laughs> uh, but maybe you're too self critical there in that part? Could that be it? Well, absolutely, that could be it. I'm really good at criticizing my own efforts in pretty much everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we have to, we have to, we have to lower the bar temporarily, not in the end, but like we have to move forward. Otherwise we're going to lose momentum and, and we'll come to a halt. But we have to say, okay, good enough, move on. Good enough. And then I think the person who finishes 10 okay songs will succeed more than the one who's trying to finish that one perfect song, which usually never gets finished. So you, you need 10 bad songs and mediocre songs to get to that one good one anyway. So. Just keep finishing it. Give yourself a timeline, yeah, and move on. Good advice. Easy said and done. Yeah, the one. Well, the one thing I guess, and you made me realize this in in your response there. But the one thing that was helpful for me personally was I was okay to leave bad parts while we worked on the rest of the song, knowing I had the basic structure down. But usually, it's something like, uh, you know, I rush this fill, or um, I I thought I wanted to play this way, but I I don't. I want to play it, you know, more straightforward, less try and be less busy or whatever but i was i was able to do because my recording actual recording sessions for my own pieces were uh relatively brief you know like in bursts maybe an hour at a time mm -hmm. 
And uh, I was fine to leave things however they were until, uh, you know, we made some progress or I'm like, I'll come back to it tomorrow or later in the week and give it another shot. So I, I suppose that was okay. But, you know, part of it too was working with a guy who I'm like, I can't send it that. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be a little better for, for my own, I guess, self-worth. <laughs> sure, sure. So we want to we want to try to be up to par with anyone we're working with. Yeah, yeah, no, no, a little bit of you know perfectionism is okay, but uh, not something that stops you completely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I've forgotten that you were. Uh, I, I think you told me in one of our past conversations that you were a logic instructor or a certified uh, logic instructor. Is that still your primary tool these days for for the doc? Um, yes, for some reason it's been since logic first came out and until now. Yes, I used other ones in the meantime, but. No, if you're used to something and you're efficient in it, it's, it's, that's, you know, it's time saver. Yeah. I started doing my, my first demo in GarageBand knowing that I should upgrade to something and I assumed it would be logic. And I had done a lot of podcast episodes, including maybe both of your last ones. I don't know for sure the first one in GarageBand, but once I got logic and got used to it, I've been using it for podcasting as well. So <laughs> that okay, good, good. makes sense to, to do that. And then switching gears kind of back a little more toward the front of our conversation. What are you doing these days to get going, to start your day, to um, move in the direction that you wish you would move every day? <laughs> it's interesting because I yeah, spent the, the good first week of this year just trying to you know, write out my perfect day and my perfect year in, in a way of fine tuning, like what, what could be improved? Where do I feel not satisfied? And, 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 and also lay out my day like that. And, and starting the morning is, is kind of crucial. Um, and, and I need a good hour to, to do things that are not work related to be really fully present in here. So I, I do all kinds of things from cleaning the pool to actually jumping in the pool, no matter how cold it is to have my, you know, breakfast and all these things and doing a bit of yoga and meditation and things like that. So just to be ready. How, um, but how cool does it get there? By the way, you want it in Fahrenheit, right? So it's not cold temperature wise. Um, it might get down to 55 or so. Okay. It seems not too bad, but when you're in a house that's 350 year old and these stone walls, they can be very damp and you sit there and you get really chilly inside. It's like an old Jeez. castle. Wow. So it can be damp and a little cold in winter, but normally it's pretty, pretty okay. I'm a Celsius guy now, by the way, since I've been in bed. Oh, really? Okay. So, <laughs> no. I try so to be, the, I the really pool, do. The pool was nine Celsius this yeah. morning. So I know that's refreshing. Cold. I know that's yes. cold. Um, yeah, no, reality is, is I often have to check, but because we have such an ambient, relatively same day-to-day -day temperature here, I know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I could kind of know within a few degrees where something is this, a, you know, a, a random conversion in my head, but I still look up conversions all the time. But yeah. Anyway, I want to be a Celsius and Fahrenheit guy. <laughs> 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 well, that's cool. So what did you learn in the perfect, uh, trying to architect your perfect day or re, re, sorry, re-architect your perfect day when you tweak that? What did you learn or what, what have you? What um, have you one thing I noticed is that where, where, where does um, like dissatisfaction come into my life is, is interruptions. And, and I don't want to be a stickler about it because I want to be also flowing and open to say like, if someone needs help, I want to be able to just drop and help them. So I don't want to be so like, don't talk to me, you know, <laughs> for the next two days. But I do really, I did realize that I want to create blocks of time because that's my most satisfying way of working is this undivided uh, attention sort of work. Um, reading a book to called deep work where someone from, you know, higher academic background analyzes what great people accomplished and then the way they work. And I think it's going a little bit against all that social media momentum we have of going into 17 directions at the same time, which always felt so dissatisfying to me. And I feel like I'm a much better human being when I can have at least three, four hours, give me a block. I write a song, I do something, I improve something in a song or do something administrative, but I felt, okay, that's done. Ah, now, now, okay. Now I can do different things and multitask if needed, but I really want to in include these blocks and also maybe a couple of days a week without any appointments. So I can, once I get into the groove, I don't have to look at my watch and say, I have to be out there at five again. So that I think for me is a really big luxury. If I can create a day or two a week where I can work till five or till seven, or I stop at three, but 
I can flow with it in a way. So does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I like that. I was really just looking for some tips, so that was good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, when we spoke the first time, I believe it was, we talked a little bit about house concerts, and I know things have changed since then. Have you had any interest in or done any or see any on the horizon? And I ask because I did my very first one only uh, at the beginning of 2020, pre just pre pandemic for for most of the world anyway and it mm -hmm. was a really wonderful experience and one that i hope i can recapture again in the future but what about you i don't know if, if, if i mentioned this before but i did house concert, a house concert when my record came out and i i love house concerts i always done it and last year i did not did i do one or two um but not too much because i really was preoccupied with um this course but this year when i release the songs i definitely want to go back into doing house concerts and i think it's a really great format uh, and yeah. you, you can control the sound the environment the ambience and you can yeah you have we also support us usually there people who actually listen you know it's 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 a nice atmosphere so i definitely want to do it again but i didn't want to i'm basically just getting the new repertoire down i have my old record i keep practicing that so i can have songs from there but i'm kind of also try to get my new songs under the belt so how much practice time do you give yourself when you're like preparing? Let's say you have one coming next month or something or in a couple of months. How much practice hmm. time do you normally give yourself? I'll definitely play every day. Um, definitely do warm ups every day, singing wise and, and just touch the guitar every day. But then it gets pretty technical. Last time I played everything myself with loopers and things like that. So I mm -hmm. had to really coordinate and practice that coordination of triggering things and all. Yeah, that was a, an instrument in itself. So depends a bit how elaborate I'm going to do this. Um, but then the week before the gig, I definitely, you know, I'm not as a person who ever played like 100 gigs in a row, you know, I'm, I'm playing selected gigs. And so I, it takes me a little bit longer than maybe just a touring musician to get everything down. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love that. I was looking for like, how much should I be spending? <laughs> I always <laughs> feel like I should spend more. Mark, it, it was a pleasure as always to chat with you. I'm going to make sure that people know they can find you at mockphoenix.com with the funny spelling and all, plus on your Instagram, because uh, I wasn't sure that they were totally connected. What about finding out about your course? I can put some links in the show notes later, but is there anywhere else that you like any other way that we can tell them to find it or the best way they can flow? Um, if, if, if someone forgets, musicalarchitects.com is uh, also a portal to go to the course, but the, the course is in the end on Udemy. I I would appreciate it if they come through my portal because A, I get paid more. And secondly, I can offer a discount code. So Udemy, it's just fluctuating. Sometimes you get a good price and sometimes it's up at, you know, 89 or 119. But uh, on the portal, I can make sure it's always discounted because I wanted to make it really affordable. And I get paid a bigger, a bigger commission that way too. All right, cool. Good to know. As always, a pleasure, my friend. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Roberto. This episode of The Unstarving Musician was powered by Podcast Startup, the learning platform for creators with a voice. Podcast Startup covers tech, production, editing, marketing, and more. I know what it feels like to be slowed down by challenges revolving around fear, procrastination, and tech, yet I've recorded and published over 260 podcast episodes. To learn more about Podcast Startup, go to unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast startup and to get free podcasting startup tips right to your inbox. Again, visit unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast startup to learn more and to get your free podcasting startup tips. This episode was powered by Banzoogle, the platform for musicians and bands to build their website and manage direct to fan marketing and sales. Banzoogle features powerful design options, a commission free store to sell music, merch, and tickets detailed fan data, integrations with social networks, and more. Plans start at just $8.29 a month, which includes a free custom domain name. Try it at bandzoogle.com and use the promo code Robonzo, R-O-B-O-N-Z-O, to get 15% off your first year. That's bandzoogle.com, promo code Robonzo. Did you know you can help other independent musicians find the Unstarving Musician by following or subscribing on your audio platform of choice? Well, now you do, and it really does help. And if you have feedback, please go to unstoppingmusician.com to 
Get all my contact info. You can text me, call me, email me, leave a voice message right there on that page. Just go down to the bottom of the page and you'll find everything you need to know. I really would love to hear any of your comments, suggestions, questions, whatever you've got. And you can find links to just about everything talked about in this episode at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast. All right, I'm peacing out. (laughs) Thank you for listening and sharing with your musician friends and fellow indie music fans. Peace, gratitude, and a whole lot of love.